I want to speak to you this morning about the sound of focus. The sound of focus. Focus has a sound. And if you Afrikaans, focus have a sound. If you didn't catch that one, it's because you're Afrikaans, okay? <laughs> I'm just teasing you guys. I'm, I'm so excited this morning. Um, I, I know last week was a little bit tough, but I've got good news. This week is going to be even tougher. Okay, so you need to, we put the nice soft seats in. We've got the strong coffee this morning. So I want to share something, and it's not really specifically from, from my heart originally, but I am extending the message from a spiritual father overseeing a lot of churches, and he's been sharing this, this, these thoughts with me, and I, I took that to heart, and I built my, my message to you this morning around these ideas. So I'm going to ask you that you bear with me as we start. The sound of focus, let's jump in. Now the main passage is going to come out of a, of, out of a weird text if I can put it to you this way. The, the, the thing we're going to talk about is not going to be as obvious as it's usually in the section. So I do not specifically enjoy ministering this way because um, I like to use scriptures within their context. But for the purpose of this message this morning, we are going to take the truth within this context and apply it outside of context to our lives. And it doesn't mean I'm adjusting the word. You will see as we progress through this, um, it's a timely word. It's an important word. And we have to take this out from this section this morning. Can I get an amen on that one? Awesome. Let's start. 1 Corinthians um, 14. You guys can just change my um, stage display there at the back. From 1 to 9. Only 9 verses. Oh, can I just gossip? Someone at the back, I won't name names, just said, Oh, Pastor John, I'm so thankful this morning. Why? Because you only have 25 slides. <laughs> Usually I've got like 69, 72. And so Tammy put down that ad. Any case, so let's start. <laughs> 14 verse 1, let's start. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. I just want to pause over here. We spoke about Pentecost, and I've got a, I've got a may I use the term with, 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 um, a, lot of, a lot of humility. I do have a prophetic message this morning, but just to get practical for a second, when we look at Pentecost and um, the outpouring of the Spirit, it's clear from the Scripture that the languages that they were speaking was understandable by the community around them. But what Paul specifically is speaking to here is the speaking of tongues that we are familiar with in Pentecostal denominations. But what's interesting about this is he doesn't promote speaking in tongues. So, so I'm just mentioning this for interest. If you guys want to go study this, he, he, he encourages people to go from speaking in tongues to prophesying because it makes it simple. He says, because people can understand when you prophesy. People can't understand when you're speaking in tongues. So this is, this is a, a sub-note for some guys who likes to do some Bible study. I think I'm at verse 3 now, right? On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Verse 4, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Verse 5, now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Unless someone interprets, not interrupts, interprets so that the church may be built up. Paul getting being a spiritual man, but understanding the practical application of what it means to be the church. I want you, I know it's just a little bit, um, bit fuzzy now. I'm going to get to my message in a second, so please just put on your thinking caps this morning. Verse 6. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophesy or teaching? If even lifeless, listen carefully, if even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? 
Verse 8, and if the bugle, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, the, the, the trumpet, if the bugle um, gives an indistinct sound, listen, who will get ready for battle? Verse 9, so with, your, so with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. Distinct sound, if the sound is not um, distinct, who will know how to get ready for the battle? And if it's not clear and focused, it will be empty words that you are speaking into the air. More about that passage in a bit. This, uh, last night I was by my parents' place. And we were speaking about a, a, a couple of older days, and I was sharing with them something that happened in this week to me. In this week, we were driving with our family. I, I can't remember where we were going to. We were just going to some other place. And a memory popped up in my heart that took place about 22, 23 years ago. And it's a memory surrounded by death that's taking place. I want to take you on a small journey quickly to, to when, I was, when I was quite younger. I was below my 10 years, probably 9, 8 years old, somewhere around there. And my grandmother on my mom's side, we call her Avoir, she was diagnosed with cancer. She became quite ill quite quickly, and it was at a point in her life where she was bedlayant. I don't know what that is. She was, she was confined to her bed. She was confined to her bed. And her illness became so severe that she was at a stage where she didn't have very defined motor skills, and added to that, she couldn't communicate either. She was not unconscious, she was fully aware of what's happening around her, but she could not communicate anymore and she was dependent on people around her. So I want you to picture this, this, this narrative, I don't want to call it a story, this narrative took place just, man, maybe not even less than 500 meters just up the road. Um, what's his straat's name? Binnemann Straat is just a little bit up the road at a park um, just across my, my, my grandparents were staying there. I was a young boy and my parents were taking care of my grandmother. As the, with the family, they get together. Mom is not doing well. She, it seems like she's going to pass away. And my parents are doing everything they can to make things as comfortable as possible. Um, now that I'm mentioning this, I want you to grab hold of the atmosphere. My mom... And I don't mean to, to put in a spot or make things excessively sad, but it was my mom's mom. When you're standing around a deathbed, it's not a party. It's not an occasion. It's something that burns your heart every time you walk through that doors. Because your memories of happiness, your memories of joy is changing to a situation where the one you love is in need. And there's nothing that you can do. And you are praying and you are holding on. And it seems like God is not popping up on the scene. It seems that God is not popping up on the scene. That's the atmosphere. And my parents trying to protect myself, my sister, from, these, from the, the view that's taking place. I was put in the living room area with this old TV that was playing. Okay. And just across, as, you, as you're sitting in the lounge area, you can look into my grandma's room just across the road. So I could see her laying in the bed, but it wasn't much. Because it was small. I wasn't understanding what's going on. I know something was wrong with the voix. But I was sitting there watching TV, and my parents is taking care of her. I'm a small boy. Watching TV. And in Portuguese, I was just wanted to make sure um, I got the wording right. My grandfather put on macaques for us. Was that the right word or was that the wrong word? Macaques, yes. In Afrikaans, that sounds not really so comfortable off a pulpit, but in the Portuguese community, I'm watching my Nikis on the TV, okay? And so now I'm sitting over there and I noticed from the corner of my eye, my grandmother becoming restless. She can't speak. Her movement is limited, and she's pointing to something, and my parents is not fully aware of what's taking place. And out of my grandmother's frustration, my dad, almost said my dad at the time, <laughs> my, my dad, who's still my dad today, but at that time, at that moment in time, my dad was well built, and he was nice and fit and lean. He looked sexy, and so he, he, he picks up my grandmother. Now hold up, right there. 
I'm talking about the Portuguese lady, ladies and gentlemen, okay? I have the authentic Portuguese grandmother who was imported from the islands of Madeira, okay? I'm talking about you don't get more real Portuguese like that Portuguese lady, okay? And my dad picks her up. And now he needs to do something, okay? Because she needs, she's frustrated. Something wants to happen. She doesn't, she doesn't really know how to communicate. And he's speaking on my grandmother and walking around a little bit in the room, being braggerich, okay? Because my other, my mom's Portuguese brothers, they aren't very, they are like Portuguese men, you know, short and tingerig and all those things. All the, so, so they couldn't, but my dad picks her up and, we notice she's kind of pointing towards the living room area where, where I was seated. <laughs> I'm a little bit narcissistic. I don't know where Alejandro was in this story, so it's about me. So we're just going to carry on with the story that way. And so he motions her into, to, she motions him to, to move towards this living room area. And he carries her, and she, they come across, and I see him carrying, and he, and he puts her down on the one bench, okay, on the opposite bench of what I'm seated on. Thinking that, you know, being in bed for a while, it's nice to get out a little bit. It's nice to have a normal life for a change, sitting or watching a little bit macaques with the grandchildren on the TV. It's nice. But, <laughs> any case, now my grandmother seems still agitated because something's not right. She wants to say something, and we can't get to what's happening. And my dad, I don't know how they figured this out, but on one occasion, he picks her up. And he puts her down next to me on the bench. And all she does is lean over and she kisses me on my cheek. That's all she does. Me, being a small boy, have no idea what's happening. My grandma, my Portuguese grandma, is giving me a kiss on my lips. And immediately it was like, oh, she did what she wanted to do. My dad picks her up. And they go back to the bedroom. And that's the memory that I've got from, from my grandma. I do not want to give false information, but very shortly after that incident, my grandmother passed away. Even if, even, I think it was probably in the week somewhere, it was very close to that, to that element. And immediately I realized that even though she couldn't speak and even though she couldn't move, she had one important focus in her life. And that was to make sure that her favorite grandchild, Leandra, <laughs> was to make sure that her grandchild knows that there's a grandma that loves him. She didn't know how things were going to turn out for me. She didn't know the life choices that was going to make. But in that end part of her life, there was one moment where nothing was more important to her than that her family must know that throughout her life, throughout the mess, throughout the working out, through all the hidings, through all the, all the things that happened, there was one moment that she wanted to make sure that her family knows that she loves them. And on her deathbed, that was to me the last message she wanted to hand over. And this week something popped in my heart and I'm so frustrated with myself that I didn't see this 20 years ago. I was unable to understand what was taking place. But today, it took me 20 years to realize that for my, to my grandmother, the last thing that she wanted to do was just to kiss me on my cheek. To make sure that I am aware that there's someone somewhere that loves me unconditionally. That loves me so much that before she passes away, and when I'm talking about myself, I, I'm extending this to a family. This is not, it was like I'm the special guy. <laughs> not at all. I was the opposite, okay? I was the one who got a lot of hidings and scaling. Uh, we, we'll talk about the, the trauma I had later on. But in any case, but it, this week, it just hit me, and I got disgusted with myself because I missed the significance of a kiss on my cheek. Because I was sh sh stupid and small. I was watching monkeys on the TV. But to my grandma, there was nothing more important than the, the sound of focus. The sound of focus. Focus is sometimes something that's silent. Focus is sometimes something that doesn't always make an audible sound. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But I want you to grab hold of the story, and we're going to come back to the story in a bit now, because I want to go back to the text, and I want to share this heartbeat, this message for the church. 
Last week, if you missed this, we spoke about this. Where Isaiah is writing and he says that God is trying to speak to his people and all they want is the prophets to say smooth things. We spoke about smooth criminal last week. Smooth things. And God is getting frustrated because he's trying to reach out to his children. He's trying to speak to them and they're not listening because the prophets are coming up and stepping. Be warned. It's time to change. And the people are saying, we don't want to hear that message. We don't want God, the Holy One of Israel, to speak to us. We want to hear smooth things. That's what we were speaking about. And then we went over to Revelations, and it was speaking about God counseling us. Remember, I'm talking about a prophetic message coming to us. I know it's a little bit far from apart, but there's a spiritual significance to this. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. We spoke about this where the church needs to turn back and buy the right things by the right person and not the artificial things, the real things, and stop wanting to run after smooth things. That's what we spoke about. You guys are with me here? Okay, if you weren't here, this is the trend what we were speaking about, and it was a hard message and a loud message towards the church, and I want to build up on that. And this passage that we spoke about this morning, let's jump into that. If it feels a little bit, I spoke about my grandma on this verse, no one is going to get together in a second. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 7. And this is where Paul speaks out and Dr. Nikolantman was sharing his heart, and I want to extend this message in our context to us. And if, if even lifeless instruments, remember Paul writing, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is being played? You can put up the next one for me. Before I explain this in depth, I need you to understand this aspect of distinct notes. There's a difference between noise and music. And I feel the church is making a lot of noise. They're not making a lot of music. They're making a lot of noise. What's the difference between noise and music? Now, excluding jazz. Jazz is a phenomenon on its own. We don't talk about jazz. But in general, in general, (laughs) you need... Notes to be in proper order and to be in unison with one another in order to make a sound that is pleasing to our ear. When individual notes are played outside, outside of the natural order of music, it becomes unpleasant to our ears. It's a sound that a pot makes and a pan makes. It sounds when your child just presses a lot of notes on the, on, the, on the piano. But when you take an expert who plays the right notes that is within the discipline of that song, it becomes music. And what the message, and I, I want to, I wanna, if, if it clearly will be a distinct sound, is that I, I, I'm, I'm fearing that the church is making noise at the moment. We have never been more louder than we have been in the history of time, but it's noise. And people are picking up an unpleasant sound. The world is noticing that churches are making an unpleasant, loud sound. And it's not comfortable to their ears. And it's not nice. But there's a problem with the message that's not being nice in that sense. I'm not talking about smooth things. I'm talking about the gospel is good news. The gospel is something that's sweet to your ear. And when the world looks at us and an unpleasant sound is coming out of our mouth, it's because we have not that distinct sound where our notes that we are being played is not disciplined, it's not structured, it's just noise. It's just noise. Can I make it practical? Without God, this is just a gathering. Without God's presence, this is just a nice club for a couple of people that want to drink free coffee. But um, I think it's, uh, you can put up the next one. I'm just a little bit ahead. Go to Exodus 33 verse 16. And this is a, a very, very um, special message um, um, scripture to me. For how shall it be known, this is Abraham, that I have found favors in your sight, speaking to God. I and your people, listen to this. Is it not in your going with us, speaking to God? So that we are distinct. I want you to pick up on this word. In other words, what the author is trying to say is that 
The only thing that makes us distinguished in this world is God's presence in our life. This is from Exodus. I want you to just, just, just focus here. Just focus. Just, just, be, just be with me for a second. I feel that churches are making noise, but there's no music because there's no distinction in our sound. There's no discipline in our sound. But at the moment, we look exactly like the world, and you can't see the distinction anymore. You can't see the difference anymore because our lives is not disciplined. Our lives is not distinct than that of my neighbor. We come to church, we pluck the Jesus sticker on our head, but we walk out to live the lives exactly like the world. And there's no distinctness. And what happens is our lives makes noise, not music. Our lives makes unpleasant sounds to the people around us because God is not in the story. God is not included into this. And this is the concern for the church in the time that we are living in. And I'm just going to translate this for you. And if the sound of the trumpet is not clear and distinct, how will the army know how to get ready for the battle? If the sound of the church is not clear, and if it's not including God in what we are doing, and I'm not talking about playing God, I'm talking about really have God involved in what we are doing, how do people know how to get ready for battle? But we run off to churches that's nice things to say, nice to listen to, but there's no distinct sound. There's no difference between self-help books and when we read our Bible in the church today. There's no difference. Why? Because we have a humanistic mindset. We have a narcissistic reading of our text. And we don't care what God says. We don't care how God challenges us. We just take the Bible and stick it onto our lifestyle. Last week we spoke so much about God and Jesus coming down, changing culture. Asking you to step out of culture. And the message is concerning because the church is not distinct anymore. You and I, we are not distinct anymore. I'm not talking about being special and putting ourselves in a pedestal, but I'm asking about the heartbeat is misaligned. Something is off because the church is making noise. Loud, unpleasant noise. And this is where Dr. Nico Landman comes in and he, he quotes... A scripture, no, now I'm going to be all over the place. Forget, we're going to get back to my quotes. I want you to go to the scriptures. There's a scripture in Jeremiah or Isaiah 31, please. I think it's Isaiah 31. This is where Dr. Nico Landman comes in and he gives clear warnings. He speaks about focusing on what our function is as a church focusing on the direction of the church. And there's one passage, you guys can just check on my notes over there, where the, the scripture warns us to put up God posts on this highway. It's an Old Testament scripture. I think it's Isaiah 31 somewhere. Jeremiah 31. My apologies. Close enough. <clears throat> I just wanted to highlight this entire passage, and this is the, the message, the heartbeat for the church. Set up road markers for yourself. Make yourself guideposts. Consider well the highway, the road by which you went. Return, O virgin Israel. Return to these, your cities. And Dr. Nicolandman takes this passage out and he stands in front of the church and he's warning the church. And I want to extend this warning to you. We are accelerating down a highway, going very fast and going very loudly. But God's Spirit is clearly speaking to His church and saying, Be careful because you are rushing down a highway and you haven't set up markers for yourself. You haven't set up guideposts for yourself. You are loud. You are functioning. You are running a race very, very fast. But if you are not careful, the speed will kill you. 
And out of Jeremiah comes this part. I want you to listen carefully to this. Set up road markers for yourself. In other words, the instruction to the church is, you have the responsibility of warning yourself. You can play ignorant, we can play like it doesn't matter, but we have the responsibility of walking carefully going forward. The next part, make yourselves guideposts and consider well. Consider well. I feel the church is in in the middle of a massive cultural change. And the spiritual fathers is sitting back and they are concerned that the church is changing in the wrong direction. The reason why they are concerned is because we have a church that's well equipped with technology, but there's no spirit moving. We churches equipped with nice presentations, but God's Word is not alive in our hearts. God's Word is not alive in your heart. We attend this place, we listen to the words, but we go out in the week not to change the things that are wrong in our hearts. And the message is clear. If you want to be the church, you need to be distinct. If you want to be the church, you need to have guideposts to say, be careful, take care, because you are going too fast, but we are ignoring the warning signs. And like Samson, we will wake up one morning and we will not even realize that God is not with us anymore. We will hold on to an institution. We will hold on to a tradition. We will hold on to a religion. And God has climbed out many years ago. But as long as we show our statistics, and as long as the bank account is full, we feel we are being successful as a church. There comes a time where your fullness of your church is not a reflection of the health of your church. There comes a time where the bank account is not going to be a reflection of your heaven bank account. We are becoming entrepreneurial. We are becoming competitive. And in the meantime, God is sitting up in heaven asking (laughs) questions. What are you doing? A very, (laughs) very tough word. But there's one single word I want, you to take, I want you to take away this morning. And I know this is maybe not going to get a lot of amens and hallelujahs and all those things. I want you to focus your spiritual life. I'm sharing this with you because it's time that the church needs to focus. What does your spiritual life look like? You can't float anymore. You can't sit on the post. You need to focus and you need to discipline yourself in this walk. But it's going to be tough because you're not going to have the world's fruit when you follow God. You're going to have a different type of fruit that will look unsuccessful to the world. But the challenge is, are you being the church or are you just using the church? Are you being the church or are you using the church? And when I say church, not this building, I'm talking about you, relationship, people. The sound of focus. I want to just, my last two minutes that I've got left on my clock, I want to share this with you. This week, recalling the story of my grandmother, I was reminded of what the sound of focus sounds like. The sound of focus is not something that's in the public space. Focus is not a group of people applauding you. Focus is private. Focus is alone behind closed doors. Focus is something that's isolated. I'm, I'm thinking about my grandmother. You want to know what you want to know what focus sounds like? Her moaning when she was in the bed. As she was complaining about the pain trying to get up, that's a sound of focus. The sound of focus is my dad picking up my grandmother and 
I don't want to say being, being rude or disrespectful to her, but battling to get her up into her hands and moaning and picking up. That's a sound of focus. I want you to picture this. A small boy sitting in the living room and listening to the footstep of my dad walking with my grandmother in his arms. That's a sound of focus. The sound of focus is when my grandmother was put down in a couch and she was not satisfied because this is not where she wants to be and she's moaning and groaning. That's a sound of focus to the point where we, she was put down next to me and the, the upbuild of this focus was the sound of a small, soft kiss on my cheek. And I realized that that is the sound of focus. The sound of focus is something, it's not going to sound nice. It's not going to sound popular. It's not going to sound comfortable. It's not going to sound easy. The sound of focus is something private. It's something difficult. It's something that's going to cost you a price. But if we want to be the church, and if we want to put out the right sound that gets the people ready, we'll have to have the sound of focus inside first. But we don't have the sound of focus. We have the sound of popularity. We have the sound of being comfortable. We have the sound of convenience. But Jesus had the sound of focus when he was praying and he was weeping. Jesus had the sound of focus when he looked at his disciples and he was disgusted that they could not stay awake one hour for his journey ahead. Jesus looking at the church, God is looking down at the church and asking us, where are we focusing on? Because we are running very fast, but there's no warning signs. And it doesn't sound like focus the way we are used to. Can you go to the last slide for me, please? And this is a quote from N.T. Wright, and he says the following out of that phenomenal book that he wrote, um, The New Testament in his, old world, in his Own World. He says, what Jesus was to the nation of Israel, it's the church's job today to be that to the world. Now we get that, oh, you are loving. No, 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 no. Jesus offended Israel. Jesus offended the temple. Jesus offended the Israel's culture. He offended them so severely that they had to murder him because what he was saying was blasphemy, not against God, but against their religion. Yeah. I want to change his quote. What Jesus was to Israel, the church today needs to be to the church. Not everyone who calls themselves the church is really the church. Not everyone who likes Jesus is a follower of Jesus. Not everyone who admires Jesus is a disciple of Jesus. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, or anyone who says that you are my God. Not anyone who knocks, the door will always be opened because you need to be victorious in your life. You need to be victorious in your spiritual walk. And then Revelation says that there will be a space ready for you. We are living with a Jesus sticker, but we are defeated in our lives because we don't have the sound of focus anymore. We don't have the sound of focus. I'm concerned about the church. I'm concerned about me. I'm concerned about you. Because every time we call up the church to pray, nobody rocks up anymore. There are occasions when there are more non-believers in this building than the people who claim they believe. <laughs> okay, I'll skip that one. We'll edit that one out maybe. <laughs> I'm concerned because it's time that the church needs to put out the right, the right sound, the right sound for the other people in the church. The only person who can do that is you. I want you to evaluate. I don't care if you've been, not 
It doesn't matter if you've been in this church for, my mom always reprimands me on that one. It doesn't matter if you've been in this church for 10 years and 20 years, and it doesn't matter if you were here yesterday. Where is your focus when it comes to God? Is your focus real? Is your heart clean before God? Are you on the right platform when you stand here before God? You can tell me, yes, you can nod your head. It doesn't matter what you're trying to show me. Look on the inside. And are you focused on the right things? Are you spending time with God? Or is He just a convenience in your life? Are you committing your life to God? Or are you just running after blessings? Because if you give a 10 rand somewhere along the line, 100 rand is going to pop into your bank account. That time is done for that type of church. I want to challenge you, and I want to ask you, when we listen to the sound that your life makes, will it be the sound of focus? Or will it be the sound of entertainment? I want you to really take this to heart. And I know this is... (laughs) It's a a little bit tough this morning, but I, I, I'm frustra- I get frustrated with myself as well. God is not playing this business. He invested his heart into mankind. He invested everything. His last precious son. He invested, he gave everything. Not so that we can sit here just with a clean conscience. This sometimes shocks people, but Jesus did not die so that you can have a clean conscience. Jesus died so that you can be reconciled to God. Are you reconciled to God? What does your faith look like? Do you really believe in God? And if not, I mean, you start with honesty in your life. You just start with honesty in your life. Just admit, I'm not talking about to everyone, to yourself, where you are with God. But don't walk out this building thinking about what you're going to eat this afternoon and the work that you have to do this week. The church needs to step up. And the church needs to give out a sound of focus. And the only person that can do that is you and me. I want you to take this message to heart. Write down these scriptures. I didn't even touch half of the stuff that I wanted to touch on. So write these things down and allow God's Spirit to speak to you. This morning, can we pray? Father, my ability is limited to articulate these texts, Father. But I pray that your spirit will do the rest of the work, Father. Your people have heard, Father, this morning. And we pray that your spirit will make this message alive in their hearts, Father. We are not yet to play around. We're not yet to joke around, Father. We are yet to look at our hearts. We are yet to be reconciled to you, Father. We are yet to put our faith in you, Father. So we ask, Father, I pray for leadership right now, Father, in our church, Father. I pray for the people that you've called to step up, Father, that they will step up, that we will leave the excuses behind, that we will leave the faults behind, Father, but we will become disciplined in following you. That we will become the Pauls and the Peters that were disciplined in their walk, Father. We are not here for a popularity contest. We are not here to play church, Father. We are here to be the light and to be the salt. And may this word empower our hearts so that we can be that for the people around us, Father. I know you are concerned about your church because you have been spreading these words throughout the body of Christ, Father. But people aren't listening. We're not a lot of people here this morning, Father, and we're not a big church. But I want to put up my hand and I want to say, we are listening, God. And if the good people aren't stepping up, we've got a bunch of broken people that's willing to step up, Father. And if the holy people aren't willing to be holy, Father, there's a bunch of unholy people that's ready to say, Lord, we want you to speak to us and we want to, we want to repent. We want to fix our hearts before you. Because you matter to us. You matter to us. May your spirit speak. May Baruch be known as a church of believers. That not only hears, but responds. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen.